So I prepared a, a, a pretty substantial presentation on astronomy, but I, I think Dave covered it so well that I'm going <laughs> to sort of call an audible here and, and do something different and, and, and give you that promised uh, disciplinary whip, whiplash that, um, you know, that Piero spoke of in his introduction to tonight. So indeed, I am a composer, um, and I sometimes spend time thinking about sound and organizing it. But of late, I've been sort of preoccupied with what I call visual music. And so I wanted to take you on a tour of like a dozen different pieces. And so I'm gonna move very quickly and I'm gonna show you just excerpts of different pieces that embody some of these current concerns. And at the same time, I also have been thinking a lot about tools and what are the kinds of uh, different technologies that I employ in my work. And, and I, what I've noticed is that I keep returning to what could be considered archaic or very old-fashioned and often very simple technologies. And so I thought in an august Silicon Valley science-oriented institution with all of these high-tech things, we would have a, a little bit of, um, of, of, of an alternative tonight. So, you know, uh, this, I want to show you some, um, a, a picture of, of the wall in my home studio where I have these hammers made by a Canadian artist Maslow's Law says, basically, to paraphrase, to a man who owns only a hammer, every problem is a nail. But So what if you have different kinds of hammers is sort of my contention. Now, one of the things, the tools that we think about a lot is, it, it, of course, is instruments. I mean, composers think about what you're going to compose for and what sound world you're going to uh, employ. For me, it's pushed me into, I, I could say that I've been seduced by carpentry um, in order to produce new instruments. And I call them sound sculptures. They're instruments that are intended uh, equally for their, hopefully their visual allure, allure, as well as their arresting sonic properties. They're made of junk and hardware and found objects mounted on electroacoustic sound boards with piezo contact pickups. I play them with chopsticks, wind-up toys, knitting needles, violin bows, um, uh, all sorts of different things in my fingers. Um, this is one of them. This is called the Mouseketeer, and uh, T-I-E-R. So no trademark infringement, I guess. Um, it's on three different tiers. Um, and, it's, and, and maybe I'll just show you a little bit of, here's a, another side view. Of course, there is a uh, copper toilet flotation <laughs> bowl, you need that. Um, different squeaky wheels and nails. Um, you've got combs. All the combs that I own are permanently affixed to my sound sculptures. Uh, you have astroturf and different kinds of bells, springs, and so forth. Um, this is what the setup looks like when I perform. This is actually a picture from the, uh, some years ago in the Cantor Art Center courtyard. And all of the sounds run through these sort of high-tech signal processors that can warp the sound. They can create reverberation and echo and change the pitches of things and so forth. So what you have, in a sense, is this part, okay, which is actually made of these things. So here's a list of some of the things which are essentially, you know, levers, pulleys, and screws, which is to say medieval technologies. Okay, so let's actually go back here and let's put some dates here. This is the, the musical, the, the medieval period as musicologists like to um, sort of circumscribe. And, uh, and of course it's, you know, it's sort of false because those are not actually screws produced in the Middle Ages. They're modern machine versions of these things. But it's very, it's rather low tech. And then on this side, uh, you have all the high-tech signal processors and things. And so I'm going to use these numbers that sort of seem fitting to me. This is also misleading because this is not contemporary technology. This is, these are signal processing, uh, musical uh, uh, signal processing uh, gear, commercial gear, that's like eight or ten years old. So it's like obsolete. It's like super archaic in and of itself. Um, now... I thought I would let you hear this. I didn't bring it with, with me. But what you're going to hear is a, a passage in which four things happen. First, I pluck one of the nails. And then, secondly, I stroke the nails with uh, uh, a Japanese chopstick. Then I play both the high and low squeaky wheels. Incidentally, I have this ongoing like nightmare about a do-gooder stagehand with a bottle of WD-40. Like, and then lastly, I stroke the, um, the, the teeth of the combs in opposite directions. And let's see what that sounds like. The wheels, and then 
the cones. Now, this is my idea of a good time. Um, <laughs> not, not everybody is, some people still like pianos and violins. I, I find that like the plastic cone is indispensable. I can't imagine a world in which that would not be available to me as a musician. This is what it sounds like it, it, with just one instance of, of applying some of that processing to it, some of that computer processing. So that, that looked the same in terms of what my physical actions were, but clearly the result was quite a bit different. And in performance, I can choose to fade between, I can choose the type of the processing and those kinds of distortions, and I can choose the degree to which you're hearing a more, a quote, acoustic version versus this processed electronic version. So that's one approach. By the way, I still like pianos and violins. I still compose for them. But again, this is an extra Tamil resource that I felt that I needed to, uh, to build. Uh, the piece Echolalia, well, let me just show you what the setup looks like. This is a table of all sorts of household supplies. It's kind of for a series of Dadaist rituals that are executed by a performer. This is Brian McWhorter performing the piece. So it begins with the manual typewriter. The paper has to be torn. I like this sound very much. Inserted into a book which naturally is duct tape closed. <laughs> the book is drilled. So, and then the mayhem continues. But all of these objects are very, you know, they're sort of quotidian, rather prosaic, household, regular things. This is not fancy. Uh, this is not a, that was not a Stradivarius drill, just to make that clear. Um, Chlun is a piece that has, a, a, I think, an even more obscure instrumentation. It's for three conductors and no players. It's essentially a kind of a silent piece. Um, here's an, an excerpt from a performance. Uh, this is based on the observation of two people having a virulent argument in sign language, which produced almost no decibels to speak of, but affectively, psychologically, felt very loud. And so I started thinking about like what kinds of Musical, traditional musical parameters can be explored in ocular rather than purely aural realms. We have this, you know, musicians are trained to do and hear polyrhythms, like here's three against two. So I've got three going in my right hand while I have two going in my left hand. That has a certain sound. Here's five against three. So they come back together, you know, every fifth of my right hand or every third of my left hand. And this is what five looks like in conducting world. That's, here's a five beat pattern. And so what does it feel like when I have that same sort of thing where I have three going in my left hand and five going, you know, this is and is not that. Okay, so you can think about, and of course visual artists and architects talk about rhythm and so forth. So this was a, a chance to explore that in what is, I think, a very, uh, a very simple sort of technology. The concerto for florist, well, you know, I mean, you have the orchestra who's playing, but... Um, it's interesting to add a florist, and I think this is a, a rather esoteric instrumentation. Um, the florist is working on his thing while the orchestra is playing. Let's go to another clip. Again, I think, you know, um, another approach to visual music. Obviously, this is a kind of theater. Um, let me talk about traditional instruments. So, I, I, again, I still use them. But sometimes what musicians do is they take instruments and they use them in, um, in slightly different ways to get a, a sort of non-traditional sound. So this is just a short passage in a brass quintet piece. This is for two trumpets you're about to hear. And listen to the kind of strange sounds they make. <laughs> And then this passage, this is the St. Lawrence String Quartet, who I've asked in this one passage to affix shakers to their bowing hands so that we embellish the sort of bowed string sound with all of these different <laughs> So again, so this is maybe uh, you know a, a very simple technology, um, these kind of shakers and these weird things, but it's it extending the traditional uh, approach to instrumentation. Uh, here's a piece that's essentially the sound of human voice that I want to play for you next, and I actually want to perform a little bit of it. 
It's made exclusively from computer ma manipulations of a vocalist. So I recorded him, I took little tiny fragments, and I created this nine minute soundtrack, a stereo soundtrack. And, um, and then the performer, actually, uh, the vocalist, doesn't actually sing at all in concert. What he or she does is perform a series of hand gestures in unison. So it's this kind of mute piece. In some ways, it has a kinship with Tun, the earlier piece that was for three conductors and no players. Um, so this is the, uh, so let me, let me just play maybe a minute or two of the beginning for you. I'll attempt to perform it. computer is sort of high-tech, it's actually a very sort of, I think, prosaic way of thinking about sound, just taking a voice and manipulating it in some ways. Um, but again, clearly a kind of music, a uh, kind of visual music, a sort of choreography in a sense, right? So this is a, a piece for dancer, essentially. Uh, this is, there's an appendix in the score. Every gesture has a pictogram I've written out in an elaborate description of you know, orbital, you know, transverse, sagittal, lateral planes, and how many degrees, and how far away from the chest. It's all very specified. This is what I'm trying to remember in the, in my mind. This is what the score looks like. Um, uh, so memorization is a little tricky to say the least. I mean, it's kind of there's no real, real world reason why like saw board should be the consequent of Rubik's cube. You know, that doesn't actually like come up often. So there's the kind of um, yeah, the narrative or the rhetoric is, is a little bit um, mm -hmm. surreal. Um, let me talk about the score, and um, which I think of as um, a kind of technology in a sense. My, this is, uh, all my scores are written by hand. This is a, a more of a traditional one for five winds and five strings, one for piano. Here's a piece for, uh, for guitar, um, a piece for chamber orchestra. So um, now this is in a sort of contemporary idiom. So it doesn't look like traditional music, but it's traditional in, the, in its approach to the score. A notational specification, the composer imagines some sound image, creates some sort of specification from which the, an interpreter can uh, try to recreate that imagined sound image. You know, this, this allows some other things. Like here we have a musical mobile where players start at one of three points they choose and they proceed clockwise or counterclockwise before going on. Um, so you have these indeterminacies, do this or this or this at this point, every individual chooses. This is a moment where everyone spins these various spinners in unison that look like this. Um, and so, and then that tells them which pitch to play here and then the opposite quadrant here. And the conductor has a, a, a dynamic spinner too, so it's either going to be loud and then soft or soft and then loud. 
Uh, this is a measure that's repeated x plus one times, where x is the number of times it takes three or more players to stand up and protest. So it becomes a sort of like indeterminacy, of, it's sort of a social construct of sorts. Um, so yeah, now we have a renaissance um, you know, sort of technology. Um, so this is essentially xerography, okay? So we have printing. And, you know, of course, technologies, if we say, for example, if we say that uh, com computer software is technology, and you can, uh, then we could argue that, you know, it can be material or immaterial. And so I think the score is indeed a kind of technology. This is another, uh, this is another piece of mine um, that is uh, another unusual approach. I took, I was living in Copenhagen, and I took the subway system, and I renamed all the stations to abstract musical provocations, and the players who are synchronized with stopwatches follow the, uh, you know, the timetables in minutes past the hour. <laughs> Here's another approach. Um, the, the score appears on the face of custom wristwatches, so this is my design. I had a wristwatch company um, fabricate these watches, and the players follow the second hand as they pass over various glyphs. Uh, the players do things. This was originally from um, a commission from the Merce Cunningham Dance Company where they were dancing to players uh, who were tapping and rubbing stones according to um, what was going on. This has been done in a few other pieces of mine. Here's the detail from another piece called Wristwatch Meridian. Um, it was used in a vocal piece in an opera. This is one called uh, Wristwatch Rabbit Hole, which is actually extracted from a piece that I wasn't going to talk about tonight, but I should also mention now. It's a, very, it's a fairly recent piece, and it's based exclusively on page turns and mallet changes for the percussionist and uh, preparing an up bow or a down bow. You don't get to hear any of these things, of course. So the percussionist picking up instruments and getting ready to play them, but then they put them back down. The people moving across the stage. Um, so again, my idea of a good time deeply alienating for the rest of you. <laughs> so this is another approach. To, so I, sh I showed you some of the more conventional scores. Um, but this is a, a kind of a pictographic notation that I've been developing. Let me move these pages to the side. I'm sort of sliding pairs of pages across. This is the first time where the conventional notation was purged, and I just started drawing these glyphs and asking the question, what will performers do with them? Again, most performers find this like an insult to their conservatory education, <laughs> but there is a small and dedicated and very robust um, subculture of many people who are really excited about this. We have like conferences about this all over the world, and there's a bunch of people who are really interested and excited about coming up with their own assignations of signs, uh, visual signs to musical sounds and actions. Um, this led finally to a, a project that was done here over 2009-2010 called the Metaphysics of Notation in the Cantor Arts Center Museum. Um, it's essentially a 72-foot score uh, placed on the second floor balcony between pillars around um, uh, around the, the, this atrium. Uh, the 72 foot score cut into 12 panels, each six feet wide by 10 inches tall. And various players came in. It was experienced as visual art for most of the week, but then on Fridays from noon till one, there were these musical realizations. So again, I think our, our, and then another argument for visual music is simply the, the professional locus, you know, the place that this happened, which was a visual art museum. And, um, and then only on these odd occasions for an hour each week did we actually hear sonic realizations of them. Um, so let's see, I wanna make sure that I get to a couple other things. And, but let me show you first a close up of this score. There were some literally mobiles, uh, some burnt score fragments that were hanging, dangling there. Um, and let me show you sort of a, um, this is three panels placed one above the other and one of the things that you might notice is that there's a horizontal continuity that moves. If you can look here, this is there. You imagine this as three thirds, three panels. So this idea begets this one. There's a bunch of this kind of sinusoidal uh, circles that augment and augment, and then they kind of dematerialize. They run off the edges of the page, and then they reconstitute themselves. They sort of become more concrete here. So it's kind of a retrograde, except instead of being in a waveform, they simply are kind of in glissando fashion. And there's been this kind of mode change from this circular thing to more of a rectilinear form and so forth. So these things have kind of musical analogies and so forth. So the, the, there was this horizontal continuity. And by the way, the last glyph at the end of panel 12 was precisely the same as the first glyph on panel 1. So notionally, it makes this loop. But what you can also start to see is this little dangling bit that occurs here that comes down from this, this sort of sloping diagonal that argues for some sort of polyphony, some sort of counterpoint because it's, a, it's definitely a decidedly different material. It's not a complemental to this, this, this kind of this waveform here. This little thing comes down and then is continued right here. It's as if it's tethered in the next panel to the prior one. And similarly, you can find various things 
like this little doodad that's hanging here is the inversion of this one here on the next panel. And clearly we see these inexplicable tulips or something which are mirroring each other. So the score can be read down as uh, vertically as well as in the horizontal dimension. And if you took the 12th panel and you put it above the first panel, it would loop in the vertical dimension as well. I don't know what that means if, uh, other than that I'm like overly fussy or something. Um, <laughs> let's um, take a look at a certain part, a small part of this. Let's do a little close up on this, just so you have a little sense of the detail. And I made these with, um, I don't have any visual art training formally, I, um, but I used straight edges and drafting templates and French curves and things like that. So that's a little bit about that. The last piece that I want to share with you before moving to my conclusion is a piece, uh, the fourth movement of a piece called Straight Jacket. So it's this movement, it's for five, uh, five players. And this movement in particular, I'll tell you the instrumentation, it's for five players drawing in unison on amplified easels. So there's sort of pickups on the back that make the sound of scrawling with these big markers on pages audible. And they're actually drawing in exact unison. So they actually rhythmically all uh, are making the same sound. And let's watch just a little clip of this premiere performance. This is from the Bath Center in Canada. It's quite quiet, I, I'm sorry to tell you. So they are rhythmically aligned. They all draw at the same time. When they're drawing, when one's drawing, all five are drawing. When one stops, all five stops. But I hope you can start to see they're not drawing the same picture. They're producing five completely separate pictures. So where the metaphysics of notation was a piece that invited completely open-ended, indeterminate responses, musical responses to a pictographic score, this is a determinate set of tasks specifically governed in their tempo and their rhythm and so forth that produces, in a sense, a score that could be interpreted. And there's a kind of, you can see a kind of continuity. You can see in the middle, numbers two and three, there's a kind of set of triangles that descend diagonally from one page to the next. Let me move a little bit ahead to the end and you'll get it. Is there a soundtrack that's synchronized with that? There's no, no, they're just um, paying attention to each other. So they're not synchronized to a click track or any sound. And again, I regret that it's uh, the sound system in this room, uh, you can't quite hear the sounds of the scrawling. You have to sort of imagine them. Um, what ends up happening is that they produce uh, a picture. This is what the score looks like. There's two pages. And with each successive block or measure, the, their, an individual's picture advances and accretes in its drawing until finally the five of them produce pictures that are more or less like this. All right, what about those hammers? Charo asks. <laughs> um, so here's my, here's my feeling about, about this stuff. Um, I, so what I was always taught is that you can have less control or more control in your use of tools. And the idea was that this is the pejorative side. There's less originality and creativity if you don't control your tools as much. And if, and if you have more control of them, it's more original and more creative. Could possibly, you know, the result be. So obviously we want to be on this side. So what are, let's look at this. What would these points be? What would that mean? Okay, so I want to take you across this continuum here. So first, on the less control side, we can imagine a commercial keyboard demo song button. So first, let's, let's bring that down. So you have the demo, you have the keyboard, like some sort of synthesizer electronic piano thing that's packed with all these different sounds in it. Could be made by Casio or Yamaha or Roland or one of these companies, and you buy it. And then you press the demo button, and somebody has composed a song. You didn't compose the song. Somebody composed the song, and they've assigned all the different sounds that, as a sort of demonstration of what this keyboard can do. Is that an act? Of, is that a profound act of musical creativity? Most people would say, no, not at all. Okay, so we want to be more. We want to have more control. So we might say that okay, you have to at least compose your melody. That would be more creative if you like. You can't just like. It's not about just playing someone else's song. You should make up your own song. Okay, but pretty soon someone else will trump that person and say, yeah, but you really have to change the sound. You have to tweak the synthesizer patch. It's not enough to just accept the sound of the French horn or whatever. You should actually get in there and you should move some knobs around and you should personalize that patch to really have more of a finesse or control. 
then someone else, well, no, you should write your own synthesizer code. There's a lot of assumptions that are being made already, and you're just accepting them. You're not really scrutinizing them. So it'd be more creative if you wrote your own synthesizer code. Well, let's actually, you know, I mean, Mac OS or Linux or something, there's already, it's already a whole universe that's already creative. We, you really need to make your own universe, so you should probably end up uh, writing your own operating system, and then there's building your computer, and then designing your microchip, and then finally, you know, we're, at some point, we actually have, it's, it's, someone's gonna like, there's gonna be somebody on this side of you that's finally gonna push you to, set, to, to like actually get a shovel and dig the silicon out of the ground, or they're gonna think that you're not being like, fully creative and, you know, so I don't know that I actually want to be over the, all the way on that side. I'm happy to just sort of sometimes pick up a hammer, but of course, you know, if we look at all of, I mean, we talked about, mid, I mentioned some medieval and some renaissance technologies, but if we go back to some stone age technologies, we see some interesting things here, which are like stone tools, which of course changed our, uh, um, and fire, you know, changed our diet, which in, in turn uh, allowed the, the size of our brains to grow, okay? And clothing and shelter changed where, what kind of climates, what kind of places we could live. The sail and the wheel allowed us to get to some other places. The wheel, of course, alternative diverse sources of energy with the water wheel and pottery to store and contain food and so forth. So all these things allowed us to do, to live life in different ways, in different places, and to produce different things and have different experiences. And so I think ultimately what the artist is looking for in all, of, in all tools, in all technologies, are extra diver, uh, diversity and new options. And with that, I thank you and for your patience.